In Matthew chapter 23 of your Bible, Jesus starts talking to a group of individuals that are not exactly prime candidates for the kingdom of God, at least at that time. Verse 1 through 3, he said, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. In other words, they had the authority. They were the ones who were trying to give the people the meaning of the law. Not necessarily their lives displayed it, but at least he said, They're the ones who are sitting there and attempting to teach you. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not you after their works, for they say and do not. What is a hypocrite? It's an individual who says something and then does the opposite. You're not a hypocrite if you say, I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. And you go out and commit sin. Everybody knows you are. You're not a hypocrite. You're doing it openly. But a hypocrite is one who goes behind the scenes and then does the opposite of what he says. Drop down to verse 25 to 33. Verse 25. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter. In other words, they wash the outside very well. But within, they are full of extortion and excess. You blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. So what he's literally saying is, he's comparing this to our lives. He's telling us, don't put on a church face, walk in the building, and pretend to be something. No, you clean up your life from within first, and then automatically the outer exterior will give a true feeling of what you are inside. And people will be able to see what you really are. And you won't have to put up a facade. And you won't have to be a fake and a fraud Verse 27, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like unto whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but within full of dead men's bones, and, are all, and of all uncleanness. Even so you, you hypocrites, also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. The whole point Jesus is driving home is that we clean ourselves up internally first. It's called repentance. A change of the heart. That's the only way you can ever become a true follower of Jesus Christ. Internal conversion. Verse 29. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets. You garnish the sepulcher of the righteous. They would go out and they would just clean them up. They would wipe all the dust off of them. They would get the scrub brushes and make sure they were beautiful. And then put over the tomb, maybe the name of Moses, not Moses, but some of the other prophets, Elijah and so on. So everybody would know that the prophets belonged to Israel. And you say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. We wouldn't have killed the prophets. We would have listened to every one of their messages. We would have done whatever they said. We would have repented. Verse 31, Wherefore you be witnesses unto yourselves that you are the children of them which kill the prophets. Brethren, every one of us have human nature. We are the children of our parents who disobeyed God by nature. And so we also by nature have been grew up with a disobedient attitude toward God. And the only way that we can approach to God is a reversal of that attitude by the Spirit of the living God. Verse 32, fill you up the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you generation of vipers. How can you escape the condemnation of Gehenna fire or the damnation of hell? I want us all to understand as I enter into this message today, even though Jesus scathed the hypocrites of his day, he told them to cleanse themselves internally first then they would really be righteous instead of only having an appearance. I want you to understand that it takes time and experience to submit to the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God. It does not happen overnight, especially for the newer people who are coming under the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The spiritual truths and traits that you'll be developing takes time. 
You cannot get it overnight. So don't be discouraged if I examine a few things today, a few character traits, and if you or I seem to come utterly short and fall on our face and say, I'm hopeless, I'm helpless, I'll never be what he's talking about. Don't think that way. We all have to start somewhere and we take one step at a time in our approach to God. Just like you cannot walk to Little Rock, Arkansas unless you pick up your foot and take the first step. So it is with God. You must make the first step. In Micah, because this is what our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, under the inspiration of His Holy Spirit, wrote for our learning. Micah chapter 7, verse 18. Who is a God like unto you? that pardons iniquity and passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. So who is a God like you who's willing to forgive all sins? He retains not his anger forever. See, God can get angry because of the conduct that we have. But he doesn't retain the anger because he, Jesus Christ, and God our Father delights in mercy. Wait a minute now. When we read many scriptures in the Old Testament of the Bible, it doesn't seem like he delights in mercy, does it? Oh, yes, he does. The word delight means to be pleased with. Jesus has a great desire to be pleased with you. And mercy is to be kind, compassionate, tender with people. So literally, God Almighty is saying, because I delight in being tender, kind, compassionate toward you. If this is the very character of God, shouldn't it be our character also? The compassionate tenderness, the love that we can show to other individuals who are in distress and trouble. That should be our approach. Notice what Jesus said as our Savior in the human flesh. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, Jesus was talking to the multitudes. He said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. The word blessed here means supremely happy. Do you know the greatest joy you can ever have in your life is when you are helping and feeling empathy with someone who is down. Maybe they've had a disaster in their life and you're there to help them and to let them lean on your shoulder and maybe shed a tear with them and you encourage them and lift them up. This is showing compassion and kindness and tenderness. This is being merciful. And God said, you will be supremely happy and you will be a blessed person if you give mercy rather than condemnation. The word merciful is number 1655 in the Strong's Concordant. And I think that it is very important that you and I understand the meaning of this word. It literally means compassionate by words that come out of our mouth and fall upon the ears of our friends. And it also means compassionate in deed. What we do, not just what we say to someone, it can be that, but it also is how we react to that person. As time goes on, and as God's Spirit works in you, even the tone of your voice will eventually become gentle and kind and compassion will just flow from your lips over a period of time. But it doesn't happen overnight. So don't be discouraged. Now, why is it so important for us who have the Spirit of the living God to show mercy? I think that's a legitimate question. Why should we show mercy? When you're out in the workplace, say you're in a manufacturing job, how many people show mercy to you? It's cutthroat, isn't it? It's swearing, cursing, taking God's name in vain. And they're trying to pull the rug out from under you so they can get your job. So why is it so important to show mercy? 
I think Jesus tells us right here that you may obtain mercy. God has actually put into operation a law. It's unseen. It's just like the oxygen and the nitrogen. As I wave my hand, I feel all those inert gases that is invisible. And yet right here is a law God set into motion. That if you and I learn to show mercy, then God in turn will return the mercy to us. I'm going to give an example. This really happened. This is a true circumstance concerning the lack of mercy. No mercy was shown. There was a man about 30 years ago, maybe only 25, somewhere in that area. This particular man came into an understanding of nearly all the truth. Not quite all of it, but he did come into an understanding of a good deal of the truth. He had a wife who was totally unconverted. Totally. This particular woman even flirted with demons. She asked them to be manifest to her so she could see them personally in the room with her. She began to levitate off her bed three and four feet off the ground with nothing holding her up. She would go into a, a trance state. Then these demons would engage in what is called astral travel. The demons would leave her body and they might go 2,000 miles away to San Francisco, California. They may go into a bar or maybe some meeting of some kind. They would look around and see everything that was transpiring in that particular room. Then the demon would come back. Go back into her body while she was still in this state of trance. It would fill her mind with everything that it had seen. So that she had never gone there, but when she came out of this trance state, she could tell you everything that happened 2,000 miles away. This is true. This is the demonic world. Finally, she deserted this man, left. He had no knowledge of where she was. So after a period of time, he obtained a divorce from the state of Nevada. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15, he was not bound in marriage to her. She was not converted and she deserted him. So he was free to marry again and live in peace, but marry a believer. However, a church group that he found out about and joined up with and decided that he would attend services there did not understand the scriptures and it became a raging war between him and his new wife and those church members. And in this particular case, it was led by a woman against him. This war that raged literally destroyed this man and his wife to where they felt no one in the world was worthy of their companionship anymore because they couldn't trust them. And it divided the church and destroyed the church. There was no mercy shown. Instead of kindness, tenderness, compassion being shown by a word of encouragement for him having to battle demons, and then the desertion and the mental and psychological scars that he endured there was no mercy. There were no words of encouragement for him to continue. There was no compassion. To be exact, it was turned around so that the innocent appeared to be guilty. And the guilty one was let off scot-free. What would have you have done? You have to answer questions like that like this in your own personal life. Do you realize we live right now in a world that is crumbling? You and I are now learning the very character traits of God so that we can make proper decisions, so that we can show mercy to human beings. 
There were three factors that destroyed the relationship in that church of all these individuals. Number one, there was a lack of knowledge of the scriptures. And the Bible does say in Hosea chapter 4 verse 6, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. These people had no knowledge of what God taught from one end of the Bible to the other about divorce. So instead of having compassion upon a man that was deserted, his wife was dabbling in witchcraft, demonism, the New Age movement, they had no knowledge, so the knowledge destroyed them. A second factor that was missing was the incredible forgiveness that our great God has toward us. And it should become a very character trait within us so that we can extend the same forgiveness to one another no matter what the circumstance. You and I have never walked in each other's shoes. Some of you live in Minnesota, some in Florida, some in Colorado, some in Pennsylvania, and I have never lived a single day with one of you in those areas. You have never lived a single day with me. None of us know the circumstances that the other go through. So how in the world could this church there in Kentucky take this man and destroy him when they had a knowledge of what went on except they were self-righteous hypocrites? Maybe not in other areas of life, but in that one where there was a lack of knowledge, they felt they knew something when they didn't. But a third factor was missing that created a problem. That was the mercy of God. Not just forgiveness. Mercy. When you have mercy, you take upon yourselves to show extreme kindness to someone who is in difficulty. You're going to have a tender approach to someone and show compassion that's unparalleled in our day to day because the Spirit of the living God is oozing and coming out of you. And it's not you, it's not me, but God is working a miracle in us, changing us from human nature to His divine nature. Therefore, we can now show the mercy and the forgiveness of God which we had no capacity for before. But God is the one that does it. God gave us the faith to start with, to start obeying Him. We didn't have it. He called us and He gave us the faith. It says so in Ephesians 2. We didn't even have the faith to start obeying Him. That way when He's through with us and He makes us perfect individuals in the very image of God the Father and Jesus Christ, not one of us will be able to boast before Him. Everything that we become will be a miracle of His. And if we develop the mercy, the compassion, the forgiveness, the incredible love of God in us, it will not be on our own accord, but it's because He said, I want to take this piece of clay. I'm going to work a miracle, and I'm going to show the world these miracles that I'm working and these little hunks of clay that grow up to be big hunks of clay, I'm going to make them kings and priests. And they're going to be able to rule with absolute perfect judgment. Notice Matthew chapter 9. Jesus does look at human behavior. He knows our behavior because He's the one responsible. Matthew chapter 9 verse 9 to 13. And as Jesus passed forth from there, he saw a man named Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector, the most hated individual in the nation of Israel. He was sitting at the receipt of custom. So Jesus said to him, follow me. So he arose and he followed him. And it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house, they were having lunch or supper, one or the other. Behold, many publicans or tax collectors, the most hated people in Palestine, and sinners came and sat down with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, remember, he's already scathed them and told them they ought to clean up their act from within. They said to his disciples, well, why does your master eat with publicans and sinners? What's going on here? We thought he was a legitimate teacher come from God. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, 
but they that are sick. Brethren, every human being needs the great physician, Jesus Christ, to work a miracle in our life. Satan and his demons have so deceived the world, that's their job, that the world looks at black and calls it white. They call upside down, upright. Everything is backwards to the world. Look at verse 13. But you go and learn what this means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Jesus said, I'm not come to call the righteous. Those individuals that are so pompous, they think they're the most righteous people on earth. They can't make a mistake. They're perfect. He said, I didn't come for them. I can't get through to them. They won't listen. They've already got their own set of standards set up and nobody can penetrate. If you don't do everything just like the Pharisees said, you're the sinner. If God were to come down in person who Jesus was and tell the Pharisees, you're wrong, the Pharisees would say, no, we're not. We're righteous. Can't you see that? Jesus said, I came to call sinners to repentance. Only people who have the courage to admit they've made a mistake will ever be able to call, be called by God Almighty into the kingdom of God that is coming. He said, I will have mercy. That means he would have tenderness, kindness, and compassion upon those who already knew and could recognize that they made so many massive mistakes in their life, they needed somebody to clean it up. Somebody to give them the guidelines so they could change their life. Brethren, it's the matter of the heart. The internal cleansing. The Pharisees thought they were perfect because they kept God's law in the letter. They could read it right there in Exodus chapter 20. They even had it hewn in the tables of stone and they could go and read it. And they said, look how good we are. No, they had no room in their lives for forgiveness and mercy. None. In Matthew 23... Verse 23, once again referring to the self-righteous hypocrites called scribes and Pharisees of that day. Jesus made an important statement. And if we comprehend it, if we have a problem along this line, maybe it will open our eyes. He said, Woe unto you, verse 23, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint, anise, and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. In other words, God had a law and it said, give of your income. Hey, that's great, that's good. These guys sat down. You know what? If their tithe came out to $24.99, they wouldn't dare give a penny more to round it off to $25. That's how self-righteous these people were. Well, I did what I'm supposed to. I won't do one bit more. Look what Jesus said, though. You have missed the whole boat, folks. Because you've left out the most important things that determines your character. Judgment, mercy, and faith. Oh, you should give. But that's minor in relationship to the very character that's going to last for eternity and that determines your entrance into the kingdom of God. Proper discernment or judgment so that we can make decisions that will not wrongly affect individuals, but that will be for their benefit and lift them up. And mercy, that compassion and tenderness and that words that have to come out of our mouth when people are hurting and they're devastated. You and I must develop that incredible mercy of God and then act upon it. Show them the deeds of our consideration toward them. Without divine justice, we will never enter into the kingdom of God because that is a qualification for entering in, learning mercy. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus talks once again to some people who wanted to berate him and his disciples. Verse 1. At that time, Jesus went out, on the, he went on the Sabbath through the cornfields. And his disciples were hungry. And they began to go along and they'd pluck ears of corn and they ate them right off 
the cob, you know, hadn't even been heated in their microwave. And verse 2, And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, your disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. So you see, the Pharisees had already set up their standard of right and wrong. It didn't matter what God's law said. It didn't matter. Maybe God's law gave you latitude so that you could satisfy your hunger on the Sabbath. But they wouldn't allow for that. They said, because of the Babylonian captivity, that if you wanted to eat a cantaloupe before going to Sabbath services, you could not carry it across the room. You had to cut it in half. Carry one half, go back and pick up the other half. It was too heavy if you didn't, if you had the whole thing. I mean, this is the stupidity that went on. They had no mercy, no compassion. They had no judgment whatsoever. They were void of it. So, verse 3. Here's what Jesus said to them. Have you not read what David did? And David qualified for the kingdom of God. And it was prophesied in their own books, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, that he would be king over all 12 tribes of Israel. He said, when he was hungry, and they that were with him, here's what he did. How he entered into the house of God did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat. Neither for them that were with him, but only for the priest. Nobody could touch that showbread, only the priest that went in to do the service of God. But here is God in the person of Jesus Christ in the human flesh. Saying, or, verse 5, have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath day the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Do you realize the first day, this holy day, Harold Dixon profaned it, I profaned it, Bill Devorah and Jim Moffis profaned the Sabbath day, and yet we were guiltless? We did work. We provided the message for you. But God says, that's what I called you for. Nobody works on the Sabbath but my ministers to feed the people, and I will not have, have you to be called guilty. That's what he's saying here. The priests were not guilty, even though it was work and labor. Verse 6, But I say unto you, that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Brethren, I think one of the most devastating things today that's going on in the world in churches is that there is no mercy and that they literally condemn people who are innocent victims and then when people don't even know the circumstances they still use slander or false reports and you know they won't even allow if you were to say something to somebody else and go to court and testify if it's just you said it to somebody they won't even allow it in a courtroom because it's not absolute evidence and fact. And you know that's based upon the Bible? God said, don't you. Even if you're out in a field and you see somebody commit a sin, and it is really a sin, if nobody else was there to witness it, God said, don't you breathe a word about it. Because it's your word against the other person. And only God knows the real truth in addition to the two people that were there. And so you can't do that. Proper judgment must have godly discernment. And then the innocent victim must have mercy shown by all of us. But God is even greater than that. He's even going to show mercy upon those who are guilty. And if that's God's character, shouldn't we be developing the same kind of character? No wonder He said, love your enemies. Do good unto them who despitefully use you. In other words, you're the innocent victim. But you can show mercy and compassion upon them. And then it heaps coals of fire upon their head. It makes them ashamed. What about the mercy of the example that I used about the man's wife who was into witchcraft? Jesus said to condemn such a person shows the lack of mercy. What about either a man or a woman that lusts after someone else? What if you came into your house, you personally now, and your husband or your wife says, I don't want you anymore. 
that person had never committed adultery against you, but they lusted after someone else in their heart and mind and turned their affection to them and not to you. And then all of a sudden, you knew what the Bible said and you knew that marriage was absolutely destroyed. And there was no hope of reconciliation because that person told you, I want the other person. I don't even like to be in the room with you. What if they did that? Do you realize according to God's law, it's called alienation of affection in the courtroom and it's based upon the Matthew 5, 6, and 7 where Jesus said if you even lust after the opposite sex, you have committed adultery in your heart and you have every right to divorce that person legally in God's eyes. It's the innocent victim that we should be concerned about. Mainly in this lifetime, God will show mercy upon those who were the perpetrators of the problems later. But how would you have mercy in these cases? Or would you refuse mercy? You and I haven't walked in other people's shoes. Turn to Matthew 5. Matthew 5, it says, Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Verse 27 and 28. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, You shall not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looks on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Adultery of the heart. Alienation of affection. God shows mercy. God shows compassion upon the innocent victim. And the person who is the innocent victim is not required to live in that kind of condition if they so choose not to. It's that simple. The Bible says so. In Deuteronomy chapter 24 verse 1, this is God's law. And I'm just using this as an illustration today. We could take every part of God's law and we could zero in and find the application in our lives and how we're to show mercy. But this is the most prevalent today that destroys churches and causes them to split and divide. In Deuteronomy chapter 24 verse 1, God's law concerning divorce. When a man has taken a wife, He's married her, and it comes to pass over a process of time, see, that she find no favor in his eyes. Now, this is not because he burnt the potatoes, you know, or because uh, he left the room a minute and the cat got the steak. It's not talking about that. This is talking about major infractions that destroys and undermines the entire credibility of a marriage. Because he hath, he hath found some uncleanness in her. What is the word uncleanness? It comes from number 6172. And from the root word number 6168 in the Hebrew Strong's Concordance. It means any type of sexual misconduct and any severe violation that undermines the trustworthiness of the marriage. I gave an entire sermon on that, divorce when, going into detail this word and all the ramifications and the meaning of it. In other words, God said that the innocent victims do not have to live in deplorable, ungodly circumstances. What if a woman is being beaten on a weekly basis by her husband? Does God require that woman to continue to live in those circumstances where one day she may never wake up? According to Deuteronomy 24 verse 1, she does not because there is uncleanness in that man. When this happens to someone, how merciful are we? We didn't live in that house with those people. How do we know what went on? Are we compassionate? Are we helpful? Do we try to help them get over the pain, the hurt, the psychological scars that could last for the rest of their life? What if children are sexually abused by either a man or a woman? And as a direct result of that, it breaks up the family. 
the innocent partner in that where those little innocent children do not have to stay with that pervert. They've perverted everything that God stands for. Or do we go into a self-righteous mode of condemnation, shunning those people? Or do we help them? Do we take them in our arms? Do we let them cry on our shoulders? Do we provide a handkerchief for them? Do we tell them we love them and we'll try to understand what they're going through? Or do we rear back, take a deep breath and say it would never happen to me? Brethren, I want to tell you on the authority of God Almighty, He said to the direct relationship, you and I show mercy, that's exactly the kind of mercy we'll receive in return. You want to condemn? You want to become self-righteous, set your own standard even higher than God's standard? And then condemn another brother or sister in Christ that's headed for the kingdom of God? Then you are asking God to let you walk in the same steps that person did so you can learn mercy. And I guarantee you it's a law and it's built in and it'll come back on you every time. Be careful. You show so much love and kindness and mercy toward other individuals when they're hurting. Whether you know the full facts or not, you help those people. Could it be that those who refuse to show mercy to the innocent victim will one day become the victim themselves? I've seen it happen many, many times. In Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, Verse 28. Remember this is once again under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is God Almighty's words to us. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Aren't you thankful that living in the 20th century with all the degeneration, the degradation, the breakdown of morals the breakdown of godliness, that God has had mercy upon us. And if someone knows of your sins, they have no right to pick up a rock and start stoning you to death. Aren't we thankful that God has had compassion upon us and says, repent and change, and therefore you will not have to receive the death penalty? Oh, I am. Thankfully, the Old Testament times simply showed us legalism with no mercy. And therefore, legalism with no mercy shows one thing. It produces death. But our God is the God of the living and not the dead. Therefore, it is an absolute requirement that God have mercy upon individuals if they will receive that mercy so they can have life instead of death. Could it just be that every person alive on planet earth or that has ever trod this earth needs mercy because we have all sinned and come short of the standard God's given us? If you or I have come short in just one time, what gives us the right to condemn somebody else? It doesn't. When I look out at you, you know the, the thought that has to be in my mind? It has to be there sits a glorified son or daughter of God as if I were seeing you in your new body. That's how I have to look at you. I can't look at you and know that there's some sin that you've had in your life. Jesus blotted it out. It's not there anymore. Are we better than God to remind people of their sins when He will not? Mercy. Mercy is what God wants. In Romans 3.23, He said, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If that's the case, then no one else can ever point a finger at someone else and have a lack of mercy. Not if they're headed for the kingdom of God, they can't. Look in Romans chapter 11, where the prophecy is that one day when Jesus Christ returns, all Israel is going to be saved. Remember the sermon I gave on the very first day showing your destiny? That you're to become a ruler in the kingdom of God? And that you're the ones who are going to show forth God's way of life? 
And if these people break God's way of life, you're the one to teach them repentance. Look down in verse 31 and 32. Even so have these also now not believed. This is ancient Israel. But God's going to bring them up out of the grave and bring them into their land. He's going to pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. Then they will know the Lord. I'll start again. Even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they may obtain mercy. Think about that a minute. It says in verse 30, that they did not believe God. But in Malachi 4, or not Malachi, Micah 4, verse 1 to 6, it says that every man is going to sit under his vine and he won't be afraid. And every man will turn to his God. Whoever you are is ruler over your five cities, two cities, your county. They will turn to you and look to you for mercy. And you and I will point them to Jesus Christ in Jerusalem, Palestine, and say, here is the ultimate mercy of all the universe. And He's the one that supernaturally changed our life so that we can have mercy and show it to you. But brethren, if we don't have mercy today, how are we going to show it to the people then? Verse 32. For God hath con concluded them all in unbelief that He might have mercy upon all. One of the signs of a real Christian, after you've allowed the fruit to begin to grow after three to six years, will eventually be a great compassion for the hurts of others. And I call upon those who are older in the faith, if for some reason this mercy seems to have evaded you, I ask you to go back and ask God on bent knees and tearful eyes to give you this mercy because God wants none to lose salvation, but you will only receive mercy at His judgment seat in the direct proportion that you have had mercy upon others. If you go around condemning other people, then God will remember that and condemn you. There is no second chance with God. Either we get it right by His mercy or we will not be in the kingdom of God. But what about those who continue to retain an implacable heart with no mercy? What about those individuals? Will God show mercy upon them? Turn to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. Verse 8 to 13. These are wonderful scriptures. If you fulfill the royal law according to scripture, and we know that is the Ten Commandments of God, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, no man's ever hated himself. If you love somebody else with equal love and intensity that you love yourself, how are you going to condemn them? How will you be unmerciful toward them? Verse 9, but if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law yet offend in just one point is guilty of all. What does he mean you're guilty of all? Well, the death penalty comes no matter which one of the commandments you break, so it doesn't matter. You can keep nine of them to, perf to perfection. You break one of them, the death penalty is there. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if you commit no adultery, yet if you kill, you are become a transgressor of the law. So speak you, and so do, as they that are judged by the law of liberty. What does he mean, a law of liberty? Here is a law. We know that we've broken it. We could go down the line, and every one of us has broken every one of the Ten Commandments at one time or another in our lifetime. The death penalty has passed upon us. But God Almighty said, I will have mercy upon you. I will not hold your sins against you. Your iniquities will be blotted out. All of your crimson will become like white wool, pure in my sight. This is the mercy of God. If He has that mercy, who are we to hold something against someone else? No, when He forgives us, 
He looks at the Ten Commandments, His perfect law, and we can live within that law and never sin again because He's forgiven us of the past. We don't have to look back. We look straight ahead into the future. But verse 13, For He shall have judgment without mercy that has shown no mercy. That is one of the most powerful statements in the Bible. Do we want to have no mercy? I fear to fall into the hands of the living God. If I have no mercy upon my brother or sister in Christ, then I will have no mercy given to me. I am ready for the lake of fire. That's what it amounts to. You know what? The last five words of verse 13 are so powerful. It says, mercy rejoices against judgment. Mercy, the forgiveness of sins, the reconciliation of human beings back to our God and offered eternal life is better. It rejoices rather than realizing that you're going to die forever. Isn't it a great thing what we believe because we've learned it from the great God of the universe? Oh, the love and the mercy and the compassion of our God. If we could only have it in just a small measure as He does. There are two kinds of wisdom in the world today. One is fleshly. That's the mind that we're born with, our intellect. Then there are spiritual. There is spiritual wisdom. The spiritual wisdom can only come from God. It's a supernatural miracle. It's something that we were not born with. That's why you and I need to realize that everything that we are, everything that we become, is a direct result of the mercy of God and Jesus Christ giving us His Holy Spirit that begins to perfect us. This means we are going to have to put off worldly wisdom and put on spiritual wisdom. When we obtain true spiritual wisdom that comes only from God, not from ourselves, we can't generate it within ourselves, then mercy will become evident in a person's life. You know what? When a person has made a mistake and they come to you maybe in confidence and, and, and they want to tell you about this sin because it's so awful to them, you know what you'll say? Hey, don't worry about it. Just ask God to forgive you. That's all you'll say. You won't judge them. You won't condemn them. Because the love of God and the spiritual wisdom of God knows that He has forgiven all of our sins. I knew a woman. I don't know her. I knew of her. But the minister who told me about her had first-hand knowledge and he was on the scene when he heard the confession. There was a prostitute in the state of Hawaii who had begun to learn the truth of God. This woman was learning mercy that God would forgive her and she was having a difficult time because she was with from three to five men a night. She was making a lot of money. But she was convicted that this was wrong. So she began to come to a knowledge of the truth. And the minister that she saw on radio was going to Hawaii to hold a campaign. When she saw for the first time his face on television, it shattered her. Because he had been one of her clients. This destroyed this woman. She never continued in her walk toward God. The only thing I can say is if this man repented of his 400 affairs with women, God will have mercy upon him. Just like our one or two little mistakes here and there that we may feel that's all we've ever committed. You see, there is no sin too big for God to forgive. We as human beings for some reason think Something is too big to be forgiven. 
There's not one sin too big to forgive or none of us would be in the kingdom of God. Not one of us. This is the incredible mercy of God and it must come from us to other people. Everyone that we ever come in contact with. Now don't feel bad if you're not living up to standard. Only God can do this. But we can go little by little toward the character of God. In James chapter 3, verse 13 to 17. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? This is what James is asking the church. Let him show out of a good conversation or good conduct his works with meekness and wisdom. In other words, show by the lifestyle you live and of serving and helping other people and not condemning and failing to show mercy. Show people by the way you live who you really are that you're Jesus Christ's younger brother. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom, this kind of thing that brings up bitter envy, jealousy, strife among brethren and people sitting back in the audience saying, I can preach better than him. I ought to be up there. Oh, that just irks me. You know why it irks me? That's the way I was. And I hate it because it was keeping me out of the kingdom of God. This wisdom descends not from above. It is earthly, sensual, devilish. Anytime envy comes between individuals, it is worldly wisdom that creates division, creates hardship, and there is no mercy. Verse 16. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Do you want me to tell you what I have observed at this Feast of Tabernacles? I have observed the most pure in heart individuals in one area that I have ever experienced in my life. There has not been one complaint, one root of bitterness in an individual here that I've met and everyone else has said the same thing. That's why God has shined upon us. Because where there is confusion, there is every evil work. And here there has been nothing but goodness and godliness. And I thank God for that. That says something about your heart. Verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above, that's the godly wisdom that transfers God's mercy to us and then we show it to other people is first pure. See, when I look at you and you look at me, the only way we can look at each other is say, that's a potential son or daughter of God. They're going to be in the kingdom. They're perfect human beings, even though we're not. We have to look at each other like God looks at us. Then peaceable. The wisdom that's from above brings peace. What have we had at this feast? Peace. Gentle. What have we had? Nothing but kindness and sweetness and gentleness with each other. And everybody fellowshipping with each other and laughing until your stomachs hurt. And easy to be entreated. Have you gone up to anyone here that you couldn't just come up and talk to as if you'd known them all your life? Not a person. Not a person. It's been the most incredible feast I've ever spent. This is my 28th one. And I've never been to one that there hadn't been some problem until this one. And notice what it says. This wisdom that comes from above. It's full of mercy and good fruits. Not bad fruits. And it's without partiality. It doesn't matter what your status in life is, whether you're a doctor, lawyer, a senator, a congressman, or whether you lost your job and you're about to be thrown out of your house. The people here have been without partiality. And I praise God on your behalf for this wonderful scenario. And it says without hypocrisy, without pretending, 
Nobody's come in here with a church face that I know of. They've come with smiles because it came from within. And because they're happy and joyful to be here among God's people. Where it's so obvious that God's Spirit has been here. Just listen to every message that Jim Moffis has given. That Harold has given. That Bill Gavor has given. Every one of them has helped us to grow and to come closer in a relationship with God. Perfect character is what God is working and developing inside of us. In James chapter 5, verse 11. James 5, 11. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Are we happy? Are we enduring? Are we enduring the trials, the tribulations that we left out in the world back in our homes? Did the Palmers leave the flood where they were flooded out twice? And it's all behind them and they're praising God and this is the best time of their life. Are we happy? Oh, yes. You have heard of the patience of Job. Not Junior over here. Harold. And have seen the end of the Lord or the purpose of the Lord. That the Lord is very pitiful and tender mercy. Brethren, this is the very character of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. According as His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Notice now, it says according to His divine power, that's where all these things come from. We can't regenerate them from within ourselves. Through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and to virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Brethren, I showed you on the first day, you have a promise of inheriting immortality. Where you will have life regenerate within yourself, you will never die, you will never suffer again. You'll never know the heartaches and the pains that we know today. You will never lack mercy ever again. You will be so merciful that the whole world will desire to be like you, or at least everyone in your kingdom. And it says here that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. What is it that you and I are striving for today? To put on the very character of God Almighty. And one of the traits of this great God that's created all things and created us in His very image, physical image, and then said, I'll create within you my very character. Then I can take the physical and relate it and transfer it to the spiritual. You will not only have a body that resembles me, you'll have a body exactly like me. Then you will have a mind just like me because you will be so merciful. You will be qualified when those come up in the resurrection to be taught the truth. I'll bind Satan and his demons a thousand years. Then I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh and you will now be qualified to show mercy to these people. Brethren, our job today, it's a training ground. Jesus' job was a training ground. His job was to learn what we suffer. Today we are learning what the world suffers so that we can have the same mercy upon them that Jesus has upon us. Will you and I dare to become merciful?